Hey church, good to see you tonight. We'll take a few minutes while folks tune in. Hey Miss Mary, how you doing? Hey Miss Charlotte, good to see you all. Hey Steve. Good to see you all tonight. Everybody hopped on real quick. I was kind of here by myself for a, for a moment. And then all of a sudden, everybody started tuning in. That's good. I hope y'all having a good day. It's been a nice day for the most, the, the little storms that came through at the end of the day. We'll take a minute or two and give folks time. Try to think, you know, this little this little period, this live feed. I still haven't got used to to the uh, the beginning of it as people are kind of getting tuned in, and uh, it's almost like you got to do like a little pre-show, like a little cartoon or something. I don't know. Have a little video playing for people. Uh, it, it's it's that that little bit of the beginning of the service is kind of kind of you're just sitting here thinking, do to do to do. What do I do? So I'm glad that you are joining. Um, I want to, while folks are checking in, um, I just kind of want to give you a heads up. Um, I always kind of like to, uh, I'm, I'm, when it comes to the lessons and uh, teaching times and sermons, I always like to, uh, I always like to have those mapped out uh, fairly far in advance. It, it just helps. Uh, in studying and preparation and uh, kind of knowing which direction that you're going. And so uh, I like to let everybody know uh, kind of what's up over the next several weeks. Uh, and uh, we're wrapping up Jonah tonight. So I'll talk about Wednesday nights uh, first. Uh, since we finish up Jonah, several people have asked me where we're going, uh, you know, next Sunday. And uh, if you haven't, if you haven't gathered by now, I'm a, I'm a book study uh, teacher. Uh, I, I, I like that style of teaching. I like that style of study. I like that style of preaching. And uh, I guess some of my influences uh, were, were book uh, study uh, uh, type preachers. And uh, I learned so much. And so uh, I think there's uh, you know, there, there's different types and styles of messages and everything. There's topical, where you pick a topic and, and you kind of preach on that. And uh, those are good. I do a lot of those at camp uh, because camp kind of gives me an outline and uh, a topic. And so, uh, like when I do a youth weekend or a D-NOW, sometimes revivals have topics. Uh, and, and so, so, but I'm not really a, a topical preacher uh, per se, uh, when we first moved to Paducah, we went to Rose Bower and, and Kenneth Puckett. Some of you may know Brother Kenneth uh, was our pastor, and he's an incredible preacher, an incredible Bible teacher, and uh, he taught, you know, through through the books, and, and I love that so much. Uh, I believe this, I, 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 that if teaching through the Word of God, teaching through the books, uh, those take care of a lot of the topics or a lot of the issues. Um, you know, social issues are a big thing, you know, now. They're, they're at the forefront of, of our world and our culture now. And uh, I believe, you know, that the Gospels and the teaching of the books, I, you know, Jesus tells us how to, to live uh, and, and to treat people. Uh, and, and so by teaching through the books and everything, I feel like that, that teaches us uh, rather than kind of say, you know, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach on this topic, this topic, this topic. And that's just me personally. Uh, and uh, that's just, just kind of how, you know, I was influenced and what I think is important. Uh, so, so that's kind of how I teach. So if you haven't gathered that uh, by now, you know, we went through Philippians. Uh, now we've gone through Jonah. And uh, so Wednesday nights, uh, you know, we, we'll, we'll go New Testament, Old Testament, and then back to the New Testament. So next week, 
we're going to start the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And uh, we're going to do it just like we did Philippians. Uh, it's probably going to take, you know, Philippians took us nine weeks. And uh, uh, we've been five weeks in Jonah. We did the overview. And then tonight makes five weeks with the chapter. But it lends itself by chapters. It lends itself. And uh, it lends itself well to, we could, you know, we could definitely have broke it down more and everything. But uh, just try to, you know, not to drag it out so much. But Colossians will spend some more time in that, possibly you know seven, eight weeks, uh, maybe maybe nine weeks. So that's kind of where we're going to be at on Wednesday nights, and then Sunday uh, I'm going to start a. It's going to be like a three part series called Relational, and uh, it's going to look at different aspects of relationships that we have and how we're to. Uh, you know, what, what does the scripture say about them and how do we treat people? How do we interact with people? How do we relate to people? And so we're going to be kind of looking at that uh, the next three weeks. The last, I'm going to look at my calendar here, the last Sunday of the month, uh, the 26th of July. Um, for those of you, some of you may not know, uh, before before I came here, you know, I, I was a full-time uh, evangelist. And with the art ministry, and every summer, uh, I, I've worked 10, last summer was my 10th year camp pastoring for LifeWays Camps, Fuge and Mission Fuge. And uh, I was scheduled once again this summer uh, to, to, to preach at, at three locations, three different camps. I basically spend my entire summers, the last 10 summers, uh, preaching at youth camps all over uh, this, the southern states and uh, parts of Kentucky. And so, uh, and doing other events. But I say all that because uh, mid-March, I pretty much, everything for God's graffiti got canceled. Everything, all, all my camps, everything, except for, for one camp, and it's not a Lifeway camp. It's a preteen camp in Texas, uh, just outside of Houston, I did two summers ago, and they invited me back uh, for this summer. And so um, I, I plan on it probably being canceled as well, but it, it's not. They're planning on having it. It's at the end of the month. And so uh, I will be traveling uh, to Texas at the end of the month to do this camp unless something changes and, and they do happen to cancel it. But uh, on that Sunday, I have uh, the last Sunday of the month, I have Brother Marty Brown coming to uh, uh, fill in for me. A dear, dear friend of mine, wonderful pastor. He has, he's retired. We've been praying for him and his family for a long, long time. They've been on our prayer list. And he was the pastor at Newton Creek. And so he's had to retire because of, of, of health reasons and everything. And so uh, you're going to be blessed. He, he, will, he will bless your hearts and he will, he will preach the word of God. And so I'm excited for you all to, to get to hear him. Some of you may already heard him. So that's got us up through July. The first Sunday in August, and I don't know what that date is because I don't have it in front of me. The first Sunday in August will be a painting Sunday. And I will be doing a painting and uh, try to have a little bit special service that involves a painting and music and the message. And so uh, I'll have more information about that. And then after that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, you pray through these things and see what direction we need to go. But but the Sermon on the Mount has been on my, my heart uh, for uh, several months now. It's it's all about relationships too. And so uh, I, I probably, unless something changes, it looks like I'll be doing uh, a, a, not a book study on Matthew, but we'll be starting in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 and taking several weeks and looking at the Sermon on the Mount. So that's kind of where we're at. Next week we start Colossians. We're back in the New Testament. And then uh, Sunday we'll be uh, looking at uh, relational. Uh, you know, how, how, do we, how, how do we handle relationships? And, uh, and then uh, Brother Marty Brown will be with us on the last Sunday unless something happens and my, my camp is canceled. But that's the, the tentative plan, right? That kind of seems what we're, we're doing. And so uh, that's kind of where we're at. So 
I hope you've had a good day. I hope you had a good week. Uh, tonight, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 4. And uh, the notes, uh, Miss Leslie, I'm so sorry. And for those of you that went last night, I posted, hey, here's the notes for tomorrow's night study on Jonah. And I put no link. I was really, really probably tired. I was doing a lot of things. I copied the link. I just didn't include the link in the post. And so there was no place to retrieve the notes. So today when I got home, I got the link up and I saw where Miss Leslie got the notes. And so the notes are up on the Uversion app. Uh, Sunday, Sunday, I uh, believe we're going to have, uh, if you want them, sermon notes in a paper copy will be available. We're going to do that. We kind of decided the prayer list is really, really important. And uh, it's, just, it's extremely important. Duh. Uh, and then we'll probably put the sermon notes on the back of that. And so uh, we'll have those if you want them, kind of like the calendar. We'll put them out on the table. And if anybody wants to grab one of those as they come in, that would be awesome. You can do so. And so I hope that's okay. So tonight, uh, Jonah chapter 4. But I would like to, if you would, let's just pray before we get started tonight. And... Uh, you know, we've, we've got a lot going on, and uh, we got folks that, uh, you know, in need of prayer. We got a church family that, uh, you know, they need prayers, and, and we've got unspoken requests, and, and we got this whole uh, virus thing uh, going on. Uh, and another thing that has drawn me to talk about, uh, you know, being relational is just what's going on in our country today. Uh, it's, it's so divided. It, it is so, it's, it's gotten so mean. And, uh, I, I wish I could say it was, uh, just lost people being mean and do what lost people do. But sadly enough, it's brothers and sisters in Christ. And, uh, it's, it's, it's just ugly. And we live, we're living in a, uh, just ugly times. And people are just being ugly to one another. Even Christians are being, they're, they're just acting ugly. And uh, we, need, we need to stop and we need to be like Jesus. And uh, so uh, I want to just kind of stop and pray uh, for, for those things and, and pray for you. And let's pray for tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for this church and I thank you for the people of Kevill First Baptist. I thank you for their love for you. I thank you for their faithfulness. God, I thank you for their faithfulness during this time, ever since March, when we decided that, you know, it just wasn't safe and we needed to, to, to stop meeting in person. They've been so faithful to come and, and to watch on Facebook Live. And, and we started being back together at church, so faithful to come. So patient, God, and, and I just appreciate that so much. And I thank you for them. I thank you for how they minister to me and how that they've loved me and encouraged me, God. I thank you for that. It means so much to me. And Father, we just, we need you. God, we, we declare our dependency upon you because without you, we, we, we can do nothing. We have nothing. We've got nothing. I think about the words of Simon Peter when John chapter 6, when a lot of the those that followed after Jesus, after they, they left, and it says, many followed him no more. And, and Jesus turned to his 12 and said, do you, do you want to go to? And, and Peter's declaration is like, Lord, where, where else are we going to go? We've got no place to go. We've left everything for you because we know you are the Christ, you're the Lord, you're our Savior, you're the Messiah. And we don't want to go anywhere. We want to be right here with you. And Father, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to be right here with you. God, I need you. I can't get too far away, Father, till I just, I just make a mess of things on my own. And Father, our world's a mess and you know that. But you've never lost control. 
Father, nothing happens that you don't know. And Father, what you call us to do is to call us to, to keep our eyes on you and to stay on task and stay on mission for you, Father, no matter what's going on in the world, because the world's broken. The world is, 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 is struggling, Father, and the, the world is just hurting because of, of sin and its brokenness and its separation from you. But Father, we can't, we can't dive into the culture. We can't hold hands with the world, Father. We can't, we can't participate in the arguments and, 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 and all the, 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 the nonsense and the bitterness and the meanness that's going off. We can't hold hands with that, God. We, we've got we to gotta be salt and light like you've called us to be. Father, we need you for that. And Father, as we meet with you tonight, those that are sick, Father, those that are on our prayer list, God, we lift them up to you. We place them in your hands. And Father, for my sister, I just I lift her up and I just pray that you will be with her and you will touch her, Father. For those that are hurting tonight, Father, for those that are discouraged, Father, I pray that you will be an encouragement to them. That just like Jonah, that we've seen all through the book of Jonah, and that we're going to continue to see tonight, Father, you just, you, you're rich in mercy. That means you never run out, Father. That, that you would just show mercy and grace, and you will just, just heap so much grace and mercy upon the hurting, Father, that, that they will know that you are their salvation, their deliverance. Father, during this time, just meet with us. Father, you are here. God, open our hearts to some, some truth, some new truth. Make clear some old truths that we, we've read before, Father, that, that, that we might be stuck on or stubborn about, just like Jonah was stubborn, Father. Just, just open our hearts and, 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 and melt them for the things that, that you love. And Father, that's souls. It's precious human souls. And God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. It is in the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles tonight, if you would turn to Jonah chapter 4 and... Uh, we will read the last chapter, 11 verses. Here we go. Uh, real, real fast recap, verse 3, right? Uh, Jonah preached, the uh, evil city of Nineveh repented. God showed mercy to them because they believed in him. And he showed mercy and he did not destroy them. It finishes up chapter 3, verse 10. says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So, remember we said Jonah can be viewed like as a play. Act 1, chapter 1, you know, it's on the ship. Act 2, uh, uh, the belly of the great fish. Act 3, Jonah in Nineveh, and this is Act 4, and, and here's how it starts out, right? God spares the city of Nineveh, and we start Act 4, or Chapter 4, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. That's his response to God being God and God sparing the people of Nineveh, okay? It pleased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not what I said when I was yet in my country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Verse 4. And the Lord alarm just went off on my uh, clock there, which is very odd. So, uh, I apologize for that. Verse four, and the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? So, so Jonah's response is, 
He's exceedingly angry and he wants to die because God spared Nineveh. And Jonah went out to the city and he sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade till he could see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plan and it made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered when the sun rose. And God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And he said, "Once you know, here he, he just, I just, I just, can I die? And it's better for me to die than to live." But verse 9, God speaks again. He says, but God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. So there we go. And so uh, we're, we're going to start, uh, we're going to kind of break it down. The first four verses, uh, it starts out, uh, it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. Okay. Nineveh's repentance led to the reaction of mercy from God and great displeasure from Jonah. So, so their repentance uh, led to the reaction of mercy. God's reaction to their repentance was mercy, okay? Jonah's reaction to their repentance was great displeasure. And the phrase uh, literally translates, it was evil to Jonah with great evil. Uh, the evil that was characteristic of the people of Nineveh is used to describe Jonah. So when it says ex uh, uh, that, that Nineveh was exceedingly wicked, that's the same word. That's how it translates that phrase was to Jonah. But this is more than just a casual temper tantrum, okay? Jonah is throwing a souped up temper tantrum pity party on steroids, okay? He literally hated what God had done. He hated it. It made him so, so mad. And what we're witnessing in Jonah is a prophet with a shocking disregard for human life and a bitter hatred towards those who had experienced mercy, okay? Perhaps he misunderstood God's mercy, and he had a limited view of God's plan for redemption of his own people. Now, remember, Jonah was a Jew. He was a Hebrew, right? Assyria, Nineveh were not. They were Gentiles. He, he the, the odd thing about Jonah, right, the unique thing about the prophet of Jonah is he prophesied to non-Jewish nation. And not just the non-Jewish nation, one who were oppressing them at the time. They were the world empire, and they were bullying Israel. They were impress, uh, uh, oppressing them, and so he had to go preach this message. Uh, we, we know from, you know, studying the New Testament and the Pharisees and the Jewish, the Jews' attitudes on those who were non-Jewish. They, they didn't like anybody that was not Jewish. So there, there's some of that going on there as well, too. Uh, but he also, he probably didn't understand fully or he had a limited view plan of God's plan of redemption of his own people. He, he, he was probably thinking, well, God's people are, they're, they're us. They're, they're, they're this nation of Israel. And anybody outside that, they can kick rocks because God's not going to redeem them. And so he's limiting God to, to a specific, you know, God, you can only be merciful to us. And so there's a big, big difference there. Now, here's the thing. We're going to talk about anger tonight because there's a whole lot going on here. Anger is the emotion that you feel when our expectation of justice is not met. Anger is powerful, and at some point it grabs each of us in its clutches. Uh, I would probably, every, every one of us has been angry at some point in time. And, and I've struggled with anger issues when I was younger. And even when I was in college and in my early 20s, uh, I had a temper. Uh, I, I struggled with it a whole lot as a hothead. And uh, I know what it's like. 
And uh, there's, there's two types of anger. There's righteous anger and there's unrighteous anger. Okay, let's look at righteous anger. Righteous anger can be a good power when under control. And our best example of that is probably, you know, is when Jesus cleansed the temple because it was not right to make a marketplace out of the temple courts. And we find that in Matthew 21, 12 through 13, John 2, 14 through 17. Now, I'm going to say this. We must be careful. We must be careful because I have seen many people claim that their anger was righteous anger and they use the example or the passage of scripture from Jesus cleansing the temple to justify their anger. And 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 I'm those cases that wasn't the case. We can say that it's righteous anger all we want to. And we can use that passage of out of context. We really really should be careful of that. And then there is unrighteous anger, and it is dangerous, and we're warned about it in the scripture. Uh, James 1.20, for the anger of a man does not produce the righteousness of God. Psalm 37.8, refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. Can you see the pattern there? Anger leads to evil and unrighteousness. Uh, Psalm 4.4, 4, be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Uh, we live in such an angry culture. The United States is so angry. People are angry over everything. And, and we got to be careful uh, because uh, it's easy to get pulled into that. Social media is, uh, you know, I used to have a Twitter account. I don't know if you do Twitter. Twitter is is toxic. Twitter is 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 garbage. Uh, it's, 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 it's evil, right? It's, it's so angry. It's so hateful. It's so mean and malicious. I had, to, I had to get away from that. Uh, Facebook, it can be that way. I monitor my Facebook account, uh, a whole lot. I keep a tight, 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 tight grip on it. Um, I monitor who I follow, who I unfollow, who I mute. It, that, that's, it's, it's just, it's just, it's good practice, uh, if you're on social media, it's easy to get pulled into those anger fights, those just arguments and stuff like that, because everybody's so uh, daggone angry these days. So uh, this is what Jonah was displaying. Jonah was not displaying righteous anger. He was displaying unrighteous anger, and he was the poster child of unrighteous anger, okay? His expectation of justice was not met. And he was angry. It's his expectation of justice, okay? It's what he thought justice would be. It's what he thought God should do to Nineveh. Because there's a big difference there. It's his expectations. His unrighteous anger was so bad it had him thinking that life wasn't worth living. He was so mad. He literally hated what God had done to the point that he wanted to die. So, that's... That's some, that's some anger, right? But what's really happening is a deeper-seated issue, and it's an issue of the heart. It always comes back to an issue of the heart. Um, when anger manifests itself, listen, Jesus says what comes out of a person's mouth is what's in their heart. And, and, and it, it's, it's a manifestation. Again, my, I, my clock is going off. I, it's craziness. Uh, so uh, the creature who is Jonah, is accusing God the creator of wrongdoing and injustice rather than looking with own, in his own heart and saying, God is always right, and my anger means that something is wrong within me. See, that's the thing. God is always right. God is always right. And, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, I think. It's a, it's a Francis Chan quote I saw. And, and uh, when... I, I don't know if I did a, a, a good idea explaining it for, for it, but he said, whenever I disagree with Scripture, I'm wrong. Or I, I have, must assume that I'm wrong. Whenever I disagree with Scripture, the Scripture can't be wrong, okay? Uh, I've got to be wrong. If I disagree, well, I don't disagree, well, I disagree with that. Well, I'm wrong because Scripture's always right. And, and it's the same thing. God is always right. And my anger means that there's something wrong within me. And Jonah's angry for three reasons. And reason number one is this. He expected consistency from God. 
Jonah expected God's actions toward Nineveh to take a certain form, okay? In his mind, God should have judged the enemy with wrath, not mercy. Jonah's own idea of what God is like that, and what he thinks God should do to sinners is wipe them out, okay? That's his own idea. And when God showed mercy to a repentant people, it went against his false expectations of God, and he was livid about it. Uh, hey, sir, get you up. you're good. I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. And he said in verse two, and he prayed, Jonah prayed to the Lord, said, oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and a merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So the second thing, Jonah is angry for three reasons. He expected consistency from God, and he had a problem with God's character, okay? Jonah is disappointed with God's character. He sees God sparing the Ninevites as a weakness and disproves strongly of sharing the Lord's compassion with pagans in Nineveh. In verse 2, I just read, Jonah quotes to God the great statement about God's self-identity. It's found in Exodus 34, 6 through 7. It said, The Lord passed before him, and that him is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Uh, he is angry with the fourfold kindness of God. And that's taken from his statement because he, he quoted that. He, he, he quoted God's, uh, you know, his self-identity. And so he had a problem with God showing grace. Jonah wasn't against God showing grace. He just hated grace being wasted on those he thinks don't deserve it, especially non-Israelites, okay? Jonah had a problem with God being merciful. Jonah took issue with God looking down at evil, violent people and showing compassion. Jonah had a problem with God being slow to anger. Jonah criticizes God for being extremely patient with undeserving people and giving them chance after chance. Uh, here's the thing, church. We would be in serious trouble if God was quick to anger. It's a good thing that he is slow to wrath and slow to anger. Listen, God is not slack concerning his judgment, but he is long-suffering, or he is extremely patient, because it's his desire that none should perish, but all should come to repentance through Christ Jesus. See, the early church was asking Peter that very question. Why does God let all these evil people live? They were being persecuted. Listen, they were being dragged into the Colosseum uh, and being uh, sport killed for sport. They were being set on fire. They were dipped in oil and set on fire, lining the street as human candles. Christians were, okay? They were being put in animal skins and, and being mauled by lions and bears, right, while fans cheered on. And then they were asking, why does God allow this evil to happen? They were asking the same question that we're still asking. And that was his response. He said, God is not slack because he's concerning his judgment. Don't think God is letting this stuff go by. But he is long-suffering. He is extremely patient because it's his desire that none perish, but all come to repentance. So it is a good thing that God is long-suffering. We would be in trouble if God was quick to anger because think about how many times that we would, would anger him just by our, our disobedience. And so it's a good thing. Uh, the last thing is, is Jonah had a problem with God's abounding in faithfulness and his covenant-keeping love in spite of the action of his rebellious people. Uh, he says, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And, and there's a complexity and depth in this divine attribute of God, okay? When it says those things together, it's a, it's a little more than just the words that we read. There's a whole lot there. The English translations used to describe it are faithful love, steadfast love, kindness, loving kindness, and love. And the best definition or translation of the term which God, 
uh, covenant commitment to his people, okay? It's a covenant type of love. It's a covenant commitment. It's what he made with his people. With unrelenting love, he binds himself to his promises to them. It's a, a covenant love, right? It's, it's different. And the closest thing in the New Testament is agape love, which is an unconditional love. It would be characteristic of God to be merciful to his covenant people, but now God directs his covenant-keeping love, this abounding steadfast love, to people outside the covenant. Okay, they weren't the nation of Israel. They, they weren't people of covenant. And so God extended that out to them. But not just any people outside the covenant, but the enemy that was oppressing them. Listen, Jesus, because of the Jews' rejections of Jesus as the Messiah, the gospel then became available to the Gentiles. That's you and I. That's the only way that we had a chance is was that God stepped out of his covenant love and extended it to those outside the covenant. The, it was his unconditional love that he extended to us. The third thing that he was angry about was this. He was angry with God's freedom to be God. This problem stems from the first two. Proverbs 19.3 says, A man's own foolishness leads him astray, yet his heart rages against the Lord. Okay? Uh, this is what happened to Jonah. Whenever we are filled with unrighteous anger, our anger is really directed at God for being God. The Lord rules over us. He does not have to do anything on our timetable. God is not in debt to us to do anything. Uh, Romans chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, let me flip over there real fast. Romans 11, 33 through 36. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. He, he doesn't have to ask our permission. God will always be God. He will always be in absolute control of all things. I'm glad about that. I'm glad I'm not in charge. Uh, maybe you've seen uh, the, the, the bill. Uh, that says, I am God and you are not. Uh, maybe you've seen that. And uh, it, it's true. He doesn't owe us an explanation. He can do whatever he wants to because he's God. And Jonah's not the only one to struggle with this. Uh, God's children have a problem with God's sovereign freedom as well. We are often guilty of being angry with God when we don't get our way or when things don't turn out like we want or think they should. And we as believers must seek after God as he's revealed in truth in the scripture. And so uh, Jonah concludes verse three with a plea for God to take his life. When things do not turn out as we desire them to, we find ourselves in truth angry with the will of God for our lives. It is then we run the gamut of feelings like Jonah. And if you see this Jonah, if you want, there's a progression here, okay? There's the pity party. It's the woe is me starts, okay? And that's where it started when he went and he sat down and uh, he was displeased. That moves to depression. And that is where we don't feel like getting up most days, Right, I don't. I just. I just don't want to do anything because I, I'm. I'm angry. I'm having a pity party, and that eases into depression. And we don't want to get up. And from there, it moves to despondency, where we check out mentally and emotionally from a relationship. Then it goes into despair, where we can't see anything good at all. And finally, if we don't recognize the downward emotional cycle, we land at Jonah's death wish because we can't see no way to make life fair. God, he says, it would be better if I were dead. And so in verse four, God asked him a question. Do you do well to be angry? Now, this is an interesting response here. I mean, let's picture how 
Jonah's behaving. Let's picture what God just did, and then let's picture how Jonah's behaving. Uh, he asked him a question, and, and, and the way that he asked him is, is, is important to kind of setting up, and it, once again, it shows the mercy of God. He does not come at Jonah with, like, how dare you, little man? How, do you, how dare you act like that towards me? Who are you, you little punk? right? I could have left you, let you drown in the ocean. I could have let you like died in the belly of the great fish. I could have struck you down on, you know, I could have taken you out a long, long time ago, but yet I spared your sorry hide. He could have done that, but, but, but he, he, he didn't. And it reminds me of the prodigal son, right? When, when the younger son comes home, the, the father doesn't berate the son said, you know what? I, I knew that you'd be back. I knew that you would fail. I knew that you'd waste all your money. I knew that you'd be crawling back to me. See, the prodigal, the, the father didn't do that at all. I said, when he saw his son from afar out, he had compassion and he ran out and to, to meet him and he hugged him and he kissed him and he put a robe and, on his body and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet and they killed the fatted calf. And that's God being merciful. That's the merciful father. And, and, and God had every right to, to dress him down, okay? He had every right to, but he didn't. And he, in, in a thought-provoking rhetorical question, he says, is it right or is it justifiable for you to be angry? He says, Jonah, is, is it right for you to be angry? And it shows the tender, long-suffering nature of God once again towards Jonah. And the word anger means to burn or to be kindled. Uh, like, you know, kindle the fire, you kindle a fire, you use kindling wood, right? And, and that kind of starts the fire and everything. See, Jonah's theology is wrong. He has some flaws in his knowledge of God's person and character. And here God attempts to help Jonah understand his compassion for all people. So then we roll into verses five through eight. There's no recorded answer from Jonah to God's question. So we find Jonah stationed outside the city underneath a shelter or a booth that he constructed. And this location is where he waited was east of Nineveh. Most likely he is pouting. His attitude is one of defiance. Uh, have you ever got onto your kids and, and they didn't like, they just, they just kind of continued to defy you or they didn't, you know, answer you when you asked for an answer and, and he, he's, he's acting like a little toddler here and uh, his attitude is of defiance. He seems that he still feels his anger was justifiable, that he was right for doing that. Um, He's most likely thinking about the question God has asked him. He's probably pondering in that around. Uh, and then uh, most likely he was sitting at a high elevation where he could view the city with the hopes that God would still destroy the city for their wickedness. Because in verse five, he says, see what would become of the city. Even that, he got on the high point, a good vantage point, he wanted a good front row seat or the best seat in the house in hopes to view the fireworks of God pouring down fire and brimstone on the city. All he needed was popcorn and a soda to watch the show. That's, he was still hoping for that. And in verse 6, we find that the Lord God appointed. Now, it, it, the Lord God, is. it's interesting that that's together, right? He appointed or ordained a plant to grow over Jonah and create shade for him and protect him from the heat and the hot sun. Now that combination of Lord God, it's a composite name is Yahweh Elohim. Uh, Elohim is used to signify God's divine creative power, which caused the miraculous vine to minister to Jonah. Uh, remember, we talked in the very, very first overview that Jonah is a book of miracles. We kind of get drawn into the great fish thing, and, and we kind of never let go of that. And that's our focus when really it's a, a teeny tiny, small, small part of it, but it's one of many miracles. And, and God ordained or appointed creation to do what he wanted it to do. He made the wind in chapter 1, verse 4, caused the storm. He appointed the great fish in chapter 2, verse 17, to swallow Jonah, and in chapter 2, verse 10, to vomit him out on dry land. And here in verse 6, 
He ordained or caused the vegetation. He, he created it. It obeys him. And in the next verse, he ordains or he appoints a worm to attack the plant and to kill it. The wind, the great fish, the plant, and the worm are all illustrations of God's continuing sovereignty over creation and his intention to be active in the affairs of human beings throughout his creation. He's the God of all creation. He controls it all. Now, not that this is overly important, and I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but I've included it just to illustrate a point and to illustrate how petty people can get when it comes to things of the Scripture. To me, this causes a big distraction from the miracle that God told a plant to grow and, and, and produce shade over Jonah, right? It says, from his discomfort, it, it, it literally means to deliver him from his evil, and that evil means trouble or calamity. Uh, this does express the general physical state of Jonah's malcontent, okay? Physical, he was, he was miserable. Uh, the daily maximum temperature in Mesopotamia is about 110 degrees, all right? So, but the temperature is not the only factor. He's stewing internally about the outcome of people of Nineveh and his own misery due to being outside of God's will. That makes him miserable, it makes for an uncomfortable existence. Now, here, here's what's petty. Here's what I want to talk about. There are debates over which type of plant it was, okay? The Hebrew word designates an unidentified garden plant. Most scholars believe that the plant is the castor vine. I always think about castor oil that we used to have to take when we were little kids. That was some nasty stuff. That's what I always think about. It's a shrub with large leaves and it's common in Eastern. The textual versions, okay, there's, there's other versions that favor the bottle gourd plant. So the, the, the Hebrew word designates an unidentified garden plant, which says we don't really know what it is. Okay, remember for the word for fish uh, in Hebrew was used for all aquatic uh, creatures, right? Well, it's, it's a plant, and we know that God caused it to grow up and, and create shade. Now, there's also versions that say it's a bottle gourd plant. So what's the big deal? Well, when Jerome was translating his Latin version, he changed the traditional rending of this word from gourd to identify it with the castor oil plant. A riot breaks out in a city east of Carthage. And this disagreement caused bitter controversy between Jerome and Augustine. Okay, so let's argue over what kind of plant it was. That 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 just that's I just want to kind of toss that in there. We're, we're kind of like that. We're going to argue over what kind of plant it was, except for the fact that God says, "Hey, plant, you grow." The plant obeys Him, and it grows shade over. Uh, it's kind of like the, the, back to the well right? or the great fish. Uh, if the scripture said a shrimp swallowed Jonah and Jonah lived in the belly of the shrimp for three days and three nights, I would believe it because God could do that. If, if the scripture says and God caused uh, a, a clover leaf or God caused uh, a, a dandelion to grow, even if it wasn't native to over there, uh, to bring shade over Jonas, I would believe it because it's you know God said it. So there's this debate, right? Well, anyway, back to the text. Whether it was a gourd plant or a castor plant, Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. He was exceedingly displeased and angry that God spared Nineveh, but a shade-producing vine made him very, very happy. But that happiness would be short-lived in verse seven. God appoints a worm to attack the plant the next day and it causes it to wither and die. In verse eight, the sun rises and God appoints a scorching east wind and the sun to beat down on Jonah to the point he was about to fall out from heat stroke. So he says, okay, Jonah, let me illustrate my point a little bit more because he's, get, he's teaching Jonah a lesson here, okay? It's an object lesson going on. We use object lessons with, with kids in children's church and stuff. Well, this is what he's doing. He's doing an object lesson, right? Jonah's so happy. Oh, I'm in the shade. I got this great vine. And he's just really kicked back and he's, he's, he's happy. And he's waiting for the fireworks. He's waiting for God. You know, God's going to change his mind because in his mind, that's what God does. And God's not going to let these people off the hook. 
and he's going to destroy them. So I got a shade. I got everything here to watch the show. And this worm that God sends, he eats it and he dies. And not only do that, he's like, I'm going to turn the heat up just a little bit. And I'm going to add this east wind and the sun to beat down on him to where he, he's about to have a heat stroke, okay? So, and we wrap up verse 8. Jonah has returned to his better, I'd be better off dead speech again. Uh, from from verse 4, 3, he says, uh, you know, that I'll be better off dead. It was better for me to die than to live. And then so then when we end up, he says, uh, it is better for me to die than to live. Okay, and said so he asked that he might die and said it's better. So that's verse 8. So verse 9 through 11, here's God's reply in verse 9. He says, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Okay, he's asking him another question. Uh, he started out asking him, he says, is your anger justifiable? Uh, so, so he asked this time, he says, do you do well to be angry for the plant? This time, Jonah answers, and his answer, he says, yes, I feel justified. It is right for me to be angry over the vine. He's like, it, it's, it's right for me. I'm angry enough to die. And that literally means he was inflamed, okay? For the first time, Jonah actually admits his anger. And this anger is the same anger used in verse 3, for three nine for God's anger towards Nineveh, except Jonah does not feel that they should be forgiven. And in verse 10, he says, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, or did you make it grow, which came in a night and perished in a night. See, Jonah's concerned about a plant. And the Lord is concerned about sinners in Nineveh. Jonah desires mercy on something temporal and non-human. God determines to give mercy to wretched, evil people. People, even believers, sometimes tend to express more passion over items than they do over the souls of people who were in jeopardy of God's wrath. I've been guilty of that before. My cell phone breaks or my cell phone goes dead. I'm angry and I come consume with that, or or we over our cars, or over our stuff, or over our our schedule being canceled, or our vacation being canceled, or you know, there's there's a million things that we get angry over, and we're more angry and we're more passionate about those, and we express more passion over those than over the souls of people who are dying and going to hell, and that's sad. And Father, forgive me when I'm like that. The Lord's questioning of Jonah intends to reveal the self-centeredness of Jonah. It, it's designed, his questioning is designed to show the lack of love and his misunderstanding of the majesty of God. God gives Jonah an object lesson in order to deliver the prophet from his faulty way of thinking. You see, Jonah had no real relationship with the plant. He did not plant it. He did not care for it. He did not put it in the soil, in the, 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 the nutrients. He didn't water it. He didn't take care of it. He didn't prune it. He had no authority over it whatsoever. He only cared for it because of what it offered him, and it offered him shade from the heat. If what can I get out of it? That's the only reason why he cared about the plant. The plant that Jonah had so much concern for had a limited existence. Even if God didn't send a scorching sun and a worm, it was still eventually going to wither and wither and, and die. It had a limited existence, right? The plant grew. The plant was gone. And the way Jonah was acting, one would think that he'd lost a loved one or something that he'd owned for decades. It, you, you would have thought this was a family heirloom that, that was so precious to them that was handed down by his great, 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 greatest, great, great grandfather. And it was the most prized possession of their family. You would have thought that he'd lost that. In God's questioning and Jonah's argument for the plant, it actually argues in favor of God's love for Nineveh. He said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And he says in verse 11, and this finishes up the chapter, and should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, 
in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. You see, the Lord had a relationship with the people of Nineveh as the creator. He has concerns for those that cannot distinguish between their right and their left. You see, the Ninevites were ignorant of God and their culture of violence, but they're still morally responsible for their actions. And the Lord is referring to an entire city of moral and ethically naive people. But that is still no excuse for their sins. They are not morally innocent individuals. It refers to their mental infancy. Okay, uh, they, Just because they weren't aware of, of, of God, uh, that didn't let them off the hook for their evilness and their rebellion. Okay, For the wages of sin is death. Everyone will stand before God. And so they were responsible for that. Um, it refers to their moral, uh, their, their moral and ethically na naive, okay? They, they were just naive to everything, but they weren't excused for the sin. So it says the number 120,000, and that stands for the entire population. And then it includes an odd phrase. It was always odd to me as well. As, you know, you go back to verse three when it talks about their herds uh, fasting and their herds, their animals and their livestock being in sackcloth, right? Well, he includes many cattle as well. In this phrase, God attempts to impart to Jonah that even cattle are superior to plants and vines. If Jonah doesn't care for the people, perhaps he might have some compassion for the cows. His mercy is great for all creation. And no, this does not mean that the cows were saved. So we can't talk about animal salvation here because that's not what that means at all. And that's how the book ends. It does not tell the final effect of God's teaching session on Jonah. It doesn't tell how Jonah responded. It doesn't tell, you know, that Jonah's like, oh God, I see your point i see your way and i uh, i understand that and i accept that uh, it doesn't say anything like that some readers feel like the book ends abruptly or it's anticlimactic but it's really not that way at all in verse 11 it concludes with the truth and the wisdom about the mercy and the grace of almighty god that's what it's all been about from from chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 4 verse 11 it's all been about the mercy and the grace of almighty god we see the ways of jonah and we see the ways of god uh, it's a choice of plants or souls and 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 that's really it's the ways of god where it's our own ways okay it's it's us having a heart for the things of god or us having a selfish heart for just ourselves. And we have to deal with that every day, okay? It's about God or it's about us. So if we're going to summarize Jonah, this is the God of Israel sovereign over the nations, all of them. It affirms that he is merciful and compassionate, not willing that anyone should perish without being given an opportunity to repent. More profoundly, the book makes the point that God's justice must be tempered and balanced by his mercy if God's world is to continue. So, it's, it's incredible. It, it, it's, I hope that you have uh, a different, little different understanding. I hope, I've been, I hope I've been able to maybe bring that out for you. Uh, ultimately, God chooses souls, and so should we. Ephesians 2, 7 says that we are to be examples of God's immeasurable riches of his grace. Um, and how we treat other people, that speaks of that example, right? So as we finish up, I just kind of want to throw this last little bit. I don't, yeah, we're getting we're running out of time. But uh, for the rest of the story, so you might ask, whatever happened to Nineveh? Because we know there's more to the story of Nineveh. Have you ever watched those reality shows that show people, uh, they get their lives kind of straight or they get their lives back on track 
or it's about their business and they get their business back on track and the show ends. And then as the credits are rolling, it says six months later or nine months later, it tells kind of what these people, you know, what's happening to these people. Well, uh, we get, we get this with Nineveh and the book of Nahum gives us the rest of the story. Okay. So if you want to know what happened to Nineveh, read Nahum. It's uh, Nahum, Micah, excuse me, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Yeah, so it's it's two over. Uh, so Assyria had been the nation of Israel's public enemy number one, all right? When the Assyrians began to expand their empire into Palestine, uh, Judah, under King Ahaz, not a good king, he initially allied with them against Israel and the Arameans. Uh, find that Isaiah 7. When King Hezekiah rebelled against Assyria, Sennacherib invaded Judah and devastated the countryside before the Lord turned them back outside the walls of Jerusalem. Isaiah 36 through 37, 1 Kings 18 through 19. He carried many of the people of Judah into exile. Eventually, the Syrians returned and made Judah one of their subjects. Uh, remember, if you go back, you can see where the Samaritans come into play. One of the reasons why the Jews hated the Samaritans during Jesus' day because they were half Jews. They had intermarried with the Assyrians. This all happened when the Assyrians were in power. They came in, they replaced the people, they took people, and they intermarried. So the Samaritans were half Jewish, and that's why the Jews hated them. And it was because of the Assyrians. That's all kind of like gives you a little timeline of how it ties in. The fall of Nineveh for Judah. If Nineveh was to fall, what it meant for Judah, it meant freedom from the oppressive hand of Assyria. Judah would not have to endure the humiliation and the economic drainage of paying tribute to a ruthless and demanding foreign tyrant. Jonah was delivering a warning. Okay, that's where Jonah went to deliver a warning. And he hoped, Jonah hoped for a different outcome. He hoped for the destruction of Nineveh, but that didn't happen. And the book of Jonah is a testimony about Nineveh turning from their wickedness and turning to God, but the future generation, okay, the future generation of Assyrians returned to wickedness and idolatry, leaving a remnant of those original believers in the city, in Nahum. God decides to remove them from power and the judgment that Jonah was wishing for and didn't get was now going to happen. Jonah prophesied to the Assyrian city of Nineveh about a hundred years before its destruction. Okay, so who defeated the Assyrians? The Babylonians were a conquering people living under the dominion of the Assyrians in about 625 B.C., they rose to power and launched an assault against the Assyrian Empire. The Babylonians pushed towards Nineveh, which was the seat of Assyrian power. And while the Assyrians were preoccupied with the Babylonians, a tribal group known as the Medes assaulted Nineveh and destroyed the city. The prophet Nahum explained in great detail why the Lord decided to remove Nineveh as a power. And when God allowed the Assyrians to conquer Israel and harass Judah, they did so with great cruelty. They built up their city by shedding blood, enslaving people, performing cruel acts of torture, and by having a disregard for human life. Listen, disregard for human life is it's a big deal to God. When we have such a disregard for human life, how we treat people, how there's murder, how there's violence, how there's abortion, how we disregard people of, of, of color, just all those kind of things, the abuse of humans, how, how sexual predators, how they treat children and other people, abuse, all those things, all those injustices to human. Listen, that's near and dear to the heart of God, and he will judge that. They engaged in sorcery and witchcraft and in contempt. The Assyrian people the Assyrian people in Nineveh treated so many groups of conquered people with extreme content. God also punished the Assyrians because of their pagan worship of false gods, even though he used this kingdom to punish Israel for their sins of idolatry. Then he decided to judge them for doing the very same thing. Assyria was destroyed in 612 BC by the Babylonians. And if you fast forward that, right, 
Israel once again disobeyed. So God used the Babylonians to come in and to conquer and to take over. And that's where you get Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you get Ezra and Nehemiah. So uh, you enjoyed it. And uh, I hope that you have a great, uh, great week. And uh, thank you for those that uh, have have tuned in to Jonah. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, I will see you Sunday. And so if you need anything in between then and there, uh, please contact me and uh, let me know if we can help you in any way. Uh, I want to just remind you of the blessing box. Uh, if you can't put things or if you, you don't want to put things in the blessing box, you can put them directly in the blessing box. But the WMU, we've moved their table. Uh, and I'm going to get a sign up for them uh, eventually. But uh, if you come through the fellowship hall, you notice there's like a, a series of bulletin boards and information that's that's for you to, to look at. And it's kind of like a central uh, location for announcements and different things. There's also some magazines and stuff that are for you to take. And then on the other side of the door, that's going to be the, the WMU station for the blessing box and to receive donations and stuff there. So you can bring stuff to church with you on Sunday if you want to bring it in. Uh, and put it on that table in the basket, then we'll make sure it gets in the blessing box. So we're still collecting uh, stuff for that. We'll continue to do so. So you be blessed this week, and uh, we will see you Sunday. And uh, have, a, have a great evening.